The Triathlon Show 297. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Dr. Phil Bellinger. Phil is a researcher and lecturer at Griffith University, Australia. Uh, we will talk today about research he has done on muscle fiber typology and how to non-invasively assess how large proportions of uh, type 1 and type 2, type 2A and t- type 2X fibers an athlete has without taking muscle biopsies. So it is a really interesting uh, technology. But uh, then uh, most interestingly, uh, Phil and his colleagues have assessed how this muscle fiber typology in athlete, uh, in athletes relate to performance and training adaptations things like how long you need to recover uh, how you react to an overload training period and so on so that's a really fascinating topic that we'll get into and we'll also discuss functional overreaching and whether it is necessary or even beneficial in endurance sports which is based on a literature review that phil has recently published but before we get into the interview big thanks to our sponsors precision hydration you can find them on precisionhydration.com along with plenty of information about how to optimize your performance uh, with hydration and uh, fueling strategies for racing and training. Precision hydration create electrolytes that you can match to your individual sweat sodium concentration and they also produce a brand new uh, range of energy products called precision fuel that uh, makes it super easy to hit your numbers because for example their gels contain exactly 30 grams of carbohydrate and no complicated maths involved when uh, as Assessing, assessing how much energy you have consumed or should consume. They also have plenty of tools like their free online sweat test and their quick carb calculator that will help you get hydration and fueling recommendation recommendations based on your uh, individual circumstances and your racing or training goals. Finally, you can book a free one-on-one consultation to refine your strategies on precisionhydration.com. If you want to get 15% off your first order, use the promo code DEATTRAFLONSHOW15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Senate. The Senate indoor swim trainer is a swim bench, an inflatable swim bench that triathletes can use to improve swim specific strength, technique, and stamina. Uh, the swim bench uh, comes with uh, plenty of features that make it super uh, specific to swimming. For example, due to it being inflatable, it has a stability element that forces you to really engage and activate your core. It is also designed to be of the perfect height to force you to get into a high elbow position in your stroke. And uh, finally, due to it being inflatable, it stores really, really small if you need to put it away somewhere. And you can just inflate it again real quick if you need to. It's simply a great tool to complement the training you do in the pool or in the open water, especially when you're a bit crunched for time. Senate currently have a summer sale going on and uh, you can get the summer sale discount plus an additional 20% off that uh, sale offer on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS, which which takes the total discount to more than 40% currently. This sale lasts until mid-August, so take advantage of it now while there is still time. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Dr. Phil Bellinger. I'm here with Phil Bellinger uh, down in Australia. Phil, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. How are you doing? Yeah, really well. Thanks for having me on. Uh, why don't you start by just uh, introducing yourself to the audience? Tell uh, tell us about yourself and, and what you do in endurance sports. Sure, yeah. So I'm a lecturer in sports science at Griffith University on the Gold Coast. So that's located in uh, the southeast pocket of Queensland in Australia. Um, and in that role, I do a little bit of teaching, but um, my main interest is in doing um, applied sports science research. Uh, and that really looks at different middle distance sports in particular. I've got a keen focus on middle distance running, so looking at the 8 and 1500, but also in track endurance uh, cycling as well. Um, and in those studies, really interested in understanding some of the individual responses to training and then also uh, pacing and performance in those athletes. 
Yeah, we'll come on to some of those topics uh, later in our discussion uh, because they they relate to some of the work that you've done um, on muscle fiber typology, which uh, I guess we'll just go into right away as the first topic. You've done some really interesting work there uh, together with some colleagues in, in Belgium mainly. But before we go into the studies and what you've done there, can you just give a general background describing the differences between different muscle fiber types and then how that theoretically or maybe as found in prior research might lead to differences in function and performance between between athletes based on their fiber type distribution. Yeah, sure. So uh, muscle fiber type composition is a term that's often used and that refers to the ratio of what we call type 1 and type 2 fibers um, or slow twitch and fast twitch fibers. Um, the type 2 or fast twitch fibers can be divided into type 2A, which are intermediate fibers, or type 2X, which are really on the other end of that spectrum, and they're um, also known as fast glycolytic fibers, and they form a bit of a spectrum in terms of their mechanical and metabolic properties. So type 1 fibers are quite uh, oxidative. They've got really good fatigue resistance, but they can't contract at as high uh, frequencies or produce as much power as the type 2 fibres. Um, unfortunately, the type 2 fibres have um, quite a large degree of fatigability, so they fatigue uh, quite a bit more quickly than the type 1 fibres. Um, and as I mentioned before, they sort of um, sit on a bit of a spectrum in terms of those mechanical and metabolic um, capabilities. Um, a lot of what we know about the muscle fibre type composition of top-level athletes comes from some really classical studies in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, back in those studies where they characterised the muscle fibre type composition of top-level athletes, they found that uh, endurance athletes and in particular um, world-class long-distance runners had obviously a really high proportion of type 1 fibres, some as high as 90 or 95%, whereas middle-distance athletes um, often have a really large between-athlete variability in where they sit on this spectrum. So middle-distance athletes can be quite successful having either a high proportion of type 1 or type 2 fibres. So you often see a really big variability in those athletes, whereas uh, sprint athletes obviously have fair fewer type 1 fibres, uh, sometimes only 25 to 30% type 1 fibres. So they've got uh, much more explosive power due to their fibre type composition. Um, and some more recent research has shown that these fibres uh, adapt really differently to an exercise stimulus. Um, and that or variation in the fibre type composition of an athlete could possibly explain some of the variation that we see uh, in response to training in groups of athletes. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. That's, uh, that's a great overview, by the way. Uh, first of all, what is the current thinking regarding fibre type shifting? I think that's maybe something that is not thought of as happening as much anymore as it used to be, but more about the function of the fibers shifting. I, am I correct in saying that? Or what is the current yeah. consensus? Yeah, so there's two schools of thought there. Um, and there's been a number of really classical studies that have looked at different uh, training prescriptions and whether that can alter the fiber type composition of an individual. And the majority of those studies show that extreme transitions between fiber types uh, are not permissible. So a type 1 fiber can't really be pushed, at least in the short to moderate term, through training to express the same capabilities of, say, a type 2X fiber. But what we do see are some more subtle changes in the fiber type composition. So in response to as little as three to four weeks of training, a type 2X fiber may be able to sort of almost convert into a type 2A fiber. But we don't really see um, extreme changes from, say, a type 1 into a type 2. Um, another aspect that we should mention is that in addition to those pure fibres, uh, individuals can express hybrid fibres. So they co-express two or more of these really important proteins that come into our classification system. Um, but some studies suggest that those hybrid fibres may actually differentiate and specialise into these pure fibres very early on. So well-trained athletes typically don't have high proportions of these hybrid fibres. Um, they really just have pure fibres. Mm, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a great, uh, great explanation. And what would you say the, the average person on the street, maybe they do a little bit of 
uh, of running a couple of times per week and a couple of uh, strength training sessions, like a typical everyday person who does some some exercise of different sorts. What, what are some? Are there any normative values for what would a typical muscle fiber type distribution be for a person like that? Yeah, there are. It probably depends on which actual muscle that you're studying. So. In a lot of these studies, we take biopsies from very superficial muscles, so possibly the vastus lateralis, or so one of the quadricep muscles, or possibly even from uh, the gastrocnemius, so the superficial calf muscle. And each muscle has a uh, preference towards being either maybe more of a mixed muscle type or more of an explosive or possibly even more of a postural muscle, which may have uh, more uh, type 1 fibres. But typically speaking, the gastrocnemius, for example, on average would be a mixed muscle. So um, if you were to take a biopsy from 30 subjects, look at the fibre type distribution, you would see quite a big variability between subjects. But on average, that muscle would be a a mixed muscle, so 50% type 1 to type 2 fibres. But, yeah, the general uh, individual who does a little bit of training would probably sit in the middle of that distribution um, so if you take the fibre type composition of a really large uh, sample group, it, it's, you'd see a bit of a bell curve where the majority of individuals would be mixed in the middle, but you would have a few extreme outliers on either side. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned there, uh, when, when you assess the muscle fibre composition, you would normally take a, a muscle biopsy. But that is something that now in that you have used in your studies, a new technique based on magnetic resonance spectroscopy to non-invasively assess muscle fibre type distribution. So can you explain uh, briefly, we don't need to be orally technical here, but, uh, but just briefly, how does this technology work and how, how accurate is it? Uh, how does it compare to using muscle biopsies? That is what we've been using in all those classical studies that you referenced before. Yeah, so in our research here at Griffith University, myself and a colleague, Claire Minahan, have uh, had a really nice collaboration with uh, a department at Ghent University Uh, where they've been employing this non-invasive technique using spectroscopy to estimate uh, muscle typology. And that technique was really pioneered by Professor Wim DeRave, who we met at a conference a number of years ago. And we thought that this was such a a nice technique, given that it was non-invasive and could be applied in elite athletes, because particularly here in Australia, uh, it's very hard to convince a world-class athlete and their coach uh, to undergo a muscle biopsy. It's uh, quite painful and uh, can or requires a couple of days off training and um, if you've seen the size of the needle it's um, yeah not something that or not a procedure that you'd enjoy uh, undergoing. Um, The non-invasive technique uh, involves the measurement of muscle carnosine which is a metabolite that's twofold higher in fast twitch fibres and it can obviously be measured non-invasively with proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy And it's also a really stable metabolite in response to changes in training load and most changes in the diet apart from uh, supplementation with beta alanine. So due to those characteristics, it makes itself a really good candidate to be a a non-invasive marker of muscle fibre type composition. Um, In terms of a direct comparison to the muscle biopsy method, based on the original study from WIMS group, there is a, a really nice strong positive association between Uh, the non-invasive measurement of muscle carnosine and the biopsy-determined muscle fibre type composition. Some of the unexplained variability between the two measures uh, may relate to the uh, sample size that you can get with a biopsy. So when you take a single biopsy, you're probably looking at two to 300 fibres. That might only represent 0.01% of the entire muscle. When you apply the spectroscopy technique, you can sample a much larger portion of muscle, so roughly 15 mils or as much as 5% of the total muscle. So it's very hard to directly compare the same sample of muscle. So that's where some of the uh, variability or non-agreement between the two methods may exist. Um, But, yeah, certainly um, there is a strong association between the two methods, but it's not a a, um, perfect association. Yeah. Yeah. Well, am, I, am I right in saying that you mentioned in one of your papers that the intra-individual repeatability of the test is even is more accurate with the uh, spectroscopy method than with the muscle biopsy because of that sample size uh, issue that you just mentioned? 
Yeah, so uh, the reliability measures, so that's where we would get a subject to undergo one of these measurements and then come back the following day or the following week under the same conditions and repeat the measurement. Uh, we see very good repeatability with the spectroscopy technique and we think that's just because we are measuring such a large sample of the muscle. Whereas a couple of other studies from different labs uh, have shown that the between biopsy variability can be quite large and to get a really precise measurement of muscle fibre type composition from taking a muscle biopsy, it probably requires three or four sampling sites within the muscle to try and reduce some of that variability. Yeah. And uh, well, one more question on the method before we go into your studies, and, and that is what is the current status of it in terms of availability to, to athletes? Where does it exist in the world? Is it something that is going to be commercialized somehow or offered commonly by university labs the same way that VO2max tests and so on are offered by university labs? What, what do you think? Yes, I think um, WIMS Group is certainly um, moving towards the commercialization of the technique and, you know, ideally in years to come, an athlete might be able to visit a, a radiology clinic wherever they might live in a major city and um, they could undertake the measurement and then get their results turned around in a really short period of time, 24 to 48 hours. Currently, it's not quite at that stage yet. Um, we're obviously doing some measurements here in southeast Queensland and WIMS Group are doing some in Belgium and they've also got some really nice collaborations with some different um, European football clubs from around Europe um, who house their own scanner and they've been able to um, outsource the expertise of WIM in his lab to be able to do some of those measurements. Um, and, yeah, it's possible in the next few years that it might be um, or it might be commercialised and there could be some routine measurements available where, um, as I mentioned, an athlete might be able to track down a local radiology clinic and obtain some results uh, really quickly, which is um, a really cool feature of the technique. Yeah, well, let's see Let's see where the space moves. Uh, now, moving on to discussing your studies. So you, you have two studies uh, that you've been involved in on this topic. And, and the first one is called Muscle Fiber Typology Substantially Influences Time to Recover from High Intensity uh, Exercise. Actually, I think that you were not an author on that study, but it's uh, you were an author of the follow-up study. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. So Aline Liebens from over in WIMS Group in Belgium uh, led this study. And um, yeah, she did a really, really nice job of it. And it was the thought behind the study really came from observations of training sessions in groups of athletes who um, are all training for the same event. Um, they might undertake a really high intensity training session and give the same perceived effort, yet the post-session recovery would be really individualised, whereas some athletes would be able to recover even between repetitions really quickly and others would sort of be in a hole for a lot longer and then even later on in that day um, still feeling quite fatigued from that. So the thought behind that study was that possibly some of that uh, individual recovery timeline could be related to variation in the muscle typology um, of individuals. So in that particular study, Aline recruited a group of subjects that had more of a fast twitch typology according to the, the scanning technique and also a group which had predominantly a slow muscle typology and they performed a sprint cycling training session in the morning and then she monitored their recovery for the next five hours and she did that um, by doing a pretty common laboratory-based uh, maximal knee extension test where you're measuring torque and a few other parameters. And she found that uh, within that sprint cycling session, both groups actually produced the same mean power. So it was just three 30-second Wingate sprints. It was just that the um, group who had more fast switch typology could produce a lot more power in the first sprint, but then they had a much greater fatigue index within each sprint and then across the three successive sprints. So overall, the work was matched within that particular session. And when she was monitoring their recovery um, at various points throughout that five-hour recovery period, she found that that slow twitch group had fully recovered their knee extension torque after only 20 minutes of recovery, yet the group with more fast twitch typology had still not fully recovered after the five hours um, of recovery that was assigned to that particular study. So it was really interesting findings in the fact that, you know, overall the perceived effort and then also the work was matched in that morning training session, yet 
uh, the recovery profiles could be so different. Um, and the major difference between the groups was obviously the, the huge variation in the fiber composition. Yeah. And, and how does that align with what has previously been known about the recovery time course of the different muscle fiber types? Is, is that something that is in line with what we know from previous research or is this the first in yeah. its kind really? Yeah. So a, a number of other studies that have um, been previously published have taken muscle biopsies and found similar results. Although this was the first study that had looked at a more extended uh, recovery timeline of five hours. The other studies had uh, focused more so on looking at fatigue within an exercise task and in the short um, periods after that. So, yeah, this was probably the first study to, to show those um, associations over such a long period of recovery. And, you know, as you'd be aware with athletes, you know, training two to three times a day, um, you know, with short succession in between those training sessions, it's got pretty big implications for how you might distribute your training over a day and then over over multiple days as well. Yeah. Uh, did she look into the the reason for the uh, for the lack of recovery in the fast twitch group? Was it um, was it a metabolic uh, reason or a neural reason, or is that something that was known or or not investigated in the study? Yeah, it, it wasn't really related to, um, you know, any metabolic reasons. So um, as you might be aware, lactate does uh, recover back to resting levels, you know, pretty quickly following a, a high-intensity training session. Um, so we don't think it was related to anything metabolic. Um, it is possible that it could be related to uh, some type of neural mechanism, but then also just the mechanical characteristics of the muscle fibres uh, that we know from classical experiments um, can be impaired for quite some time after maximal contractions. So, yeah, I think there might be something going on there at the muscle level, but we certainly need to do a little bit more research to identify those mechanisms um, that could be related to that longer recovery period in those subjects. Yeah. And, and what do you think about the... So so this study went up to five hours to investigate the recovery and, and the... Uh, the fast twitch group were still not fully recovered at that point. Do you think it would be uh, feasible to do a study where you go even longer and see, well, how long does it really take to recover fully? But also, and so I'm asking two questions at once here, apologies for that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what if, what, 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 what happens if you would have found or if you would have found full recovery at five hours or even full recovery at, let's say, 12 hours, that doesn't necessarily mean that an athlete is ready to be at 100% in their next training session after a very high intensity session. So uh, there's a lot of things going on, but I, I guess what are the practical implications that we can take from this and what is the future directions of research needed to be able to make even better, b better decisions in coaching? Yeah, well, it's recovery is pretty complex and, um, in most studies, we might focus on one measure of recovery. So this was just looking at maximal knee extension torque. So um, there might be other recovery markers that could still be impaired for, for much longer, assuming that um, knee extension torque might have recovered a few hours after that five-hour window. Um, so I think to take the step forward, we then need to um, use these acute findings and then try and transcribe those across to chronic training studies to try and individualise training a little bit more. So um, if we could identify a consistent pattern in terms of how long it may take to recover from a given session uh, and whether that could be uh, categorised based on fibre type, um, then I think those findings need to be transcribed into chronic training studies to see if we can maximise the training response. Um, but in terms of yeah, advice for, for coaches and things like that, um, it's definitely got implications for how you might distribute your training within a day or across multiple days. What you often find in endurance sports is that um, one example is that resistance training is not often prioritised and um, it probably shouldn't be prioritised all the time. But um, in this particular study, we found that, um, or Aline found that knee extension talk uh, took up to five hours and it still wasn't fully recovered in those subjects. So that's got big implications for uh, when you might program um, or prescribe a resistance training session around a morning sprint session as well. So, yeah, just how you might distribute your training session across the week is a really key um, factor that could be 
uh, we should be focused on with most coaches for sure. Yeah. The, the other thing that I found really interesting from a coaching perspective there is what you said about even though both groups had the same average power in those three 30 second sprints, the, the profile of how they produced that power was very different with the fast twitch group producing a lot of it early on in each sprint and, and more so in the first sprint than in the third sprint with gradually decreasing power, whereas the slow twitch group was much more even within the sprints and from sprint to sprint. And, and that made me think that Actually, that is a way that you potentially could even get a really sort of poor man's estimate for muscle fiber typology in uh, in a field test setting with just doing that sort of sprint interval session, if you will, and and look at the profile of how the athlete is producing the power and how much the power is degrading through the sprints and through the session. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, possibly so. Um because both in that study and in others, the level of fatigability during an exercise task is often associated with variation in muscle fibre type. Um, but as you mentioned, I don't think it's to a precise predictive level. Um, and the main reason for that is probably that fatigability within a given task is trainable. So you could have an individual with a really high proportion of fast fibres that also has good fatigue resistance just due to specific training. Um, Yet, of course, you might also have that same individual that could also have quite a high level of fatigability due to that fibre type composition. So I think at a group level, you'll always see these sort of moderate associations between a, an exercise task and, in this case, fatigability, but maybe not to the precise predictable level that you would need it at an individual level. But I do agree it, it is a good way to profile or start the profile of an athlete for sure. Yeah. So, so summarizing this study, uh, I guess the, the, the summary conclusion here is that f f more fast twitch dominant athletes take longer to recover acutely from uh, from high intensity uh, training training session and uh, and also fatigue more quickly within that exercise task than the slow twitch dominant athletes. Uh, is there anything else that we should add about this study, or or does that? Is that sufficient to, to really get the gist of it? Yeah, I think that was definitely the, the key conclusion from the study is that, you know, um, all subjects have a big variability in their recovery time course, both within a training session. Uh, so that could have implications for how you might prescribe an interval session for a group of athletes, uh, depending upon the, um, the main physiological adaptation that you we were trying to drive. Um, but then also the recovery following a session as well is highly individualised too. So they're really two aspects of recovery that um, yeah, should be taken on board and considered for all training programs. Yeah. So so let's move on to the second study. Uh, and this one uh, you were directly involved in. And uh, this one is called Muscle Fibre Typology is Associated with the Incidence of Overreaching in Response to Overload Training. And in that study, you did what you just alluded to and take things into more of a chronic training perspective and uh, see what how adaptations uh, were related to, to muscle fibre typology. So can you describe more specifically what you did there and, uh, and what you found? Yeah, so we obviously found the findings from Aline's study really interesting and then we wanted to transcribe that across to how athletes may respond to more chronic periods of overload training. So in this particular study, we recruited 24 well-trained middle distance runners. So uh, the average VO2 max was around 70 mils per kilogram per minute, so it's quite high. And then in terms of performance categorization, on average, they were sub four minute 1500 meter runners so they were um weren't world class but they were certainly well trained uh and the study period lasted seven weeks and that was broken up into three uh distinct training phases so three weeks of normal coach prescribed training three weeks of overload training where we had a relative increase of training load of 10 20 and 30 percent over a three-week overload training period and then that was back ended by a one week uh, taper period where we drastically decreased the training volume. And before and after each one of those three training phases, we brought the runners into the lab and we performed a whole host of physiological assessments and then also some different performance assessments on the treadmill. And during the actual uh, training phases of that study, we really close, closely monitored 
uh, their training intensity and volume through both heart rate, GPS watches, uh, and also due to training diaries as well. And what we're interested in doing was uh, identifying the individual responses to training after each training phase and trying to understand a little bit more um, about why there was such big variability between the athletes. And after the increase in training volume, we found that half the athletes came back into the lab um, with a uh, decreased performance and were also really fatigued. The other half of the athletes were able to maintain their performance despite still having high perception uh, levels of fatigue as well. And when we had a look at the individual variability in their performance response, we found that that was associated with their muscle typology such that those subjects with more of a slow twitch typology were better able to uh, cope with the increase in training volume and they were able to maintain their performance Whereas those with more of a slow, uh, more of a fast twitch typology, those were the athletes that weren't able to maintain their performance and had a larger performance decrement when they came back into the lab. Then we sent them out and put them on a uh, seven-day taper period, which we had a drastic decrease in training volume, and we were really trying to maximise a, a super compensation effect during that taper period. And when they came back into the lab we still found that those subjects who had more slow twitch typology had a performance super compensation, so they improved their performance relative to the prior two training periods, whereas those athletes with more fast twitch typology, they were only able to restore their performance back to the levels that they were able to achieve prior to the high-volume training period. So we found that quite interesting in the fact that athletes that are able to cope with uh, quite sudden increases in training volume uh, did have more of a slow twitch typology, whereas those uh, that uh, didn't really respond too well to the increase in training volume nor the taper, uh, those athletes seem to have more of a fast twitch typology. So we found that really interesting. Yeah, that that is interesting. And uh, it, it makes me think of one of the first things that many amateur triathletes do when they get into triathlon and get really interested in it and want to learn about training is they pick up a copy of uh joe friel's book the triathletes training bible and uh and he he describes there is it's a great book uh very very good for understanding training structure and and fundamentals and so on and and he describes his system of organizing training which is basically a three week on one week one week off uh, system where the three weeks are gradually increasing volume just like you did in that overload period and uh, that, that's something that uh, i talked about before on this podcast that um, it can work in some cases but it's definitely not my preferred way of doing things and your study was really interesting because we saw that it can work really well for for the athletes that are more slow twitch dominant but for the other half of the athletes that are more fast twitch dominant it uh, yeah it might not be the best the best choice because you you were only able to get back to the same baseline level there after, even after that deload uh, deload week of training yeah and it's um we thought long and hard about the taper period and and that taper period was just under a sixty percent reduction in training volume um, so depending upon the literature maybe the training taper wasn't quite uh, long enough. To see a performance supercompensation in all athletes, um, so it has been suggested that if you undertake a um, overload training period, then maybe the taper should be eight to fourteen days in length. But um, we thought, yeah, with the substantial reduction in training volume and also the fact that uh, perceived levels of fatigue and training readiness had also returned to baseline by the end of that taper, um, that would suggest that it was sufficient. Um, but, yeah, just under those conditions, uh, half of those athletes didn't really adopt, um, adapt too well to that training taper. Yeah. And uh, what was the magnitude of the, the correlation between muscle fiber type and, and the response, uh, the, the adaptation to, to the overload and, and then the, the subsequent taper? Yeah, so the uh, variation in um, fiber typology explained around about 30 to 35 percent of the variation in the performance response so we obviously know that performance responses are hugely complex um, but to be able to explain you know a portion of that um, you know we've, we were really excited about those results and 
yeah, really looking forward to performing some more chronic training studies in that space. Yeah, so you're, you're basically you're saying that 30 to 35% is pretty big in, in this context, in, in this type of study. Yeah, I just think because um, performance changes are, are really complex and uh, there's yeah a lot that goes into whether an, an athlete will adapt or not. So I think that is a, a pretty substantial portion of the, the training response. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes, makes perfect sense. Um, so let me see here, uh, looking at my notes again. So then uh, if we go into the thing that you briefly mentioned there, that you also uh, monitored the logs, uh, the training logs and uh, heart rate and pace uh, logs as well of the athletes, there was a perception of effort increase in the runners that were overreached in this study. And my question is, do you think that this is related to to the overreaching itself so so it that it could happen to an athlete of any muscle fiber typology if they train hard enough so that they get to that stage of overreaching and thereby would maybe be only indirectly related to muscle fiber typology or, or do you think that there is a direct relationship there with muscle fiber type that uh, if you are more fast which dominant you tend to see that perception of effort increase uh, way more quickly yeah, it's hard to say because um, although there's been lots of um, acute studies looking at the relationship between muscle typology and performance or acute recovery, there's been far fewer studies that have looked at it in this chronic training setting. So I think um, possibly, but I think more so indirectly related um, from other overreaching um, or overload training studies, it's clear that um, regardless of possibly fibre type, when athletes become fatigued and overreach in response to training, they do perceive training to be a little bit more difficult. So essentially the ratio of internal work or the physiological response to a given external training load does increase. They find that a little bit more stressful. And in that particular study, we looked um, more specifically at the training intensity distribution and we did that three ways through external running speed and then two internal responses, so both heart rate and RPE. And we didn't see any difference in the training intensity distribution due to the um, external running speed or the heart rate. It was just that the perception um, of training was much more difficult. So athletes rated more um, training sessions at a higher RPE, uh, which just substantially increased that um, training intensity distribution in zone three in particular. So it's hard to say whether that is directly related to muscle typology or whether it's just... And, and just, just, uh, just to clarify, when you say that it increased the amount of training in zone three, that is uh, as, as rated or as measured by RPE specifically? Yeah, purely rated through RPE. So there was uh, no change across the study period or between the two groups in their training intensity distribution when rated through um, or measured through an external running speed or through heart rate, it was just with the uh, perceived effort. So yeah. for a given training session, the athletes um, perceived um, training to be much more difficult. Yeah. Um, I think we can maybe uh, we can get, get back to this question a little bit uh, later on when we discuss uh, functional and non-functional overreaching, but, but I did find that a very interesting study but the, or interesting finding of this particular study, I should say. But uh, let's uh, just wrap up this one with what do you think are the implications and the conclusions of, of this study? Yeah, so I think um, it's clear that uh, coaches should be cognizant of the individual responses to train, in particular for periods of overload training. And the message definitely shouldn't get lost that um, during certain periods, it is really important to train harder and increase training volume as well. But not all athletes are going to respond the same way. And some of those individual responses can be um, identified or red flagged through good training monitoring systems as well. Uh, and I guess profiling athletes could also be another um, effective means to understand uh, which athletes may be more suited to uh, these sort of sudden or progressive increases in training volume and or training intensity as well. Yeah. And again, we'll, we'll get back to this uh, very soon. But um, one thing that I was thinking about re reading this is that uh, 
um, that actually in in many cases with many athletes you maybe just want to to avoid the overload period if you want to call it that or at least overreaching period altogether that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't increase volume but increasing volume in a way that it's not even seen by the body as as a clear overload period by just doing it very gradually can sometimes be the the best option in particular with those athletes that are maybe more fast switch dominant yeah, definitely more subtle increases in, in training volume um, or possibly manipulating other uh, training prescription variables as well, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, let's move on to to another topic that you have uh, recently uh, published a review on, uh, which was also really interesting. By the way, all the, uh, the studies that we mentioned here will be linked in the show notes, so listeners can go and have a look. Uh, but this one, uh, this review that you wrote was on functional and non-functional overreaching. And uh, the research that has been done on, on those topics and whether it's something that we should be striving for or or not. But let's start with just definitions. Uh, how do we define functional overreaching and non-functional overreaching? Yeah, there certainly could be a little bit more clarity around the terms. But firstly, functional overreaching is described as a temporary decrement in performance. Uh, that results uh, from a short period of overload training. And that may or may not lead to a performance supercompensation following a, a short taper period. The reason the term functional is in the title is that typically this period of short-term overreaching has been associated with performance supercompensation after a taper, but more recent studies um, haven't necessarily shown that. In contrast to functional overreaching, uh, non-functional overreaching is considered to be um, a state of extreme overreaching. Um, that can result from the continuation of more extended periods of overload training. And that typically leads to a decrease in performance that may not resume for several weeks or months. So yeah. this... Basically, yeah, this, to, to put it in in very simple terms there, let's say you do a, even a two-week taper, you don't get back to baseline if you have done too much training before that taper, whereas with functional reaching, you would always at least get back to baseline, if not higher get that super compensation yeah exactly right so that timeline for performance restoration with the non-functional overreaching can last weeks to months um, and you won't see a super compensation whereas with functional overreaching it's more of a short-term decrement in performance where you'll typically see a performance rebound yeah uh, you discussed a bit in the review whether these definitions make sense or if if they are if there's more to to the story than just performance decrements. Can, can you elab, uh, elaborate a little bit on, on that? Yeah, so um, just thinking about that classification system, there is a little bit of overlap in the fact that um, functional overreaching is short-term but can last um, up to a period of weeks and then non-functional overreaching can also last for a period of weeks but up to months. But typically uh, functional overreaching has been considered sufficient and necessary in order to induce performance improvements um, in athletes. But despite that premise, uh, functional overreaching is certainly associated with a number of different negative cardiovascular and hormonal or metabolic consequences. And there's now been a number of different research studies from independent groups that have shown suboptimal adaptations in athletes that were classified as being functionally overreached compared to those athletes that have undertaken the same relative increase in training load but don't show such um, severe signs of overreaching. So we've done um, a recent follow-up study in our lab where we had um, groups um, of athletes undertake these periods of overload training. So the increase in training load was the same relative increase. Um, however, after that um, particular period of training, we can classify athletes as being overreached if they have a performance decrement all those athletes that come back into the lab and are still feeling fatigued, but they're able to maintain performance. And we've had a look at some different adaptations um, in the muscle using some other non-invasive techniques um, where we can identify muscle oxidative capacity. And we found that functionally overreached athletes did not have um, or had absence of an increase in oxidative capacity in the muscle compared to those athletes that undertook the same relative increase in training load but were able to maintain their performance. And those athletes achieved this really important physiological adaptation and that was concomitant with improved performance. Mm 
And those findings are uh, um, actually consistent with a couple of other research groups now that have also shown similar findings in those athletes that are better able to cope with that increase in training load. Yeah. So what would the, uh, we'll come into, come back to some, some theory uh, in a little bit, but, but at this point, I think we can bring it back to practice a little bit there uh, because for listeners and for coaches, this is quite interesting. I think that and maybe you maybe the the best bet is really to not shoot for any sort of um of function even functional overreaching if you there are now several studies out there showing that you might get a, the same or an even better improvement by just not getting into that uh, overreaching state at all so not seeing that performance decrement just seeing the acute fatigue aspect but maintaining performance uh how do you think in practice that coaches and athletes can handle that because in in a study in a lab you would test that with something like a graded exercise test or or some other type of of test of course but that's not something that necessarily all athletes will want to do every week or or every couple of weeks to make sure that they're not overreached but is it just a matter of well can you do the session with the same performance level and uh, and when you start to see an actual performance decrement you maybe back down a bit what what do you think is the practical takeaway here yeah so i think um, at the moment, the only way to categorise an athlete that has decreased performance is to actually measure maximal exercise performance. But as you mentioned, that's not practical to continually do that on a on a weekly basis. So there are a couple of submaximal exercise tests and some different responses to submaximal exercise that a coach could choose to monitor. Uh, so a French group um, and some of Yar Lemieux's research has shown that a heart rate recovery test that could simply be performed in the warm-up of a couple of standardised sessions each week could be a good indicator of, of overreaching. But it's important when we're looking at um, heart rate and other physiological responses that these are performed in a really standardised uh, environment, so possibly indoors on a, on a trainer where you can really accurately uh, measure power output and other factors like time of day and diet are also um, kept in a really controlled uh, manner as well. But um, essentially looking at the heart rate response to a standardised bout of submaximal exercise um, and then an athlete might um, cycle at a given power output for five minutes, um, heart rate would be recorded at the end of that five-minute period and then what you'd be looking at is the magnitude of the recovery and heart heart rate uh, for that first minute of recovery and looking at the change in the end exercise heart rate to the end of that one minute of recovery uh, could be a pretty good indicator of overreaching but interestingly those athletes so would, that are would the heart rate recovery be larger a larger decrease in heart rate during that minute when uh, when you're overreached yeah so it's a faster heart rate recovery um so that's quite interesting because you would also expect to see say an improvement in fitness uh, to also be reflective of a faster heart rate recovery. So in overreached athletes, we typically see that response, but that's also concomitant with higher levels of subjective fatigue as well. So coaches should also be cognizant of the actual training phase as well. Yep, yep. Uh, all right. And going back to to some of the mechanisms behind uh, the overreaching state, you mentioned that there are several consequences, cardiovascular, metabolic, hormonal, and so on. Can can you describe that a little bit and, and what we know uh, right now about why we, we see overreaching? Yeah, so when you bring an overreached athlete back into the lab and they conduct a maximal exercise test, you typically find that the physiological responses at maximal exercise intensity are impaired, so a lower peak heart rate, um, a lower stroke volume and overall cardiac output as well. But some studies have also shown that at uh, submaximal exercise intensities as well. And that impaired cardiac response um, might be due to a reduced adrenergic response where epinephrine, which is a really important hormone that gets released during exercise, uh, could be reduced. And that results in a blunting of these typical cardiac responses that we might see to exercise. So if we're seeing this blunted cardiovascular response, then that might also be underpinning uh, some of this impaired exercise performance as well. And a couple of other studies have also showed some impaired uh, responses at rest. Uh, so there's a couple of studies uh, that have been conducted down in Canberra here in Australia where they showed overreached athletes had a lower 
resting metabolic rate. Uh, so that's not a very good sign for adaptation. Um, and I think that what's probably happening is that there's uh, a real limitation in um, some of those underpinning cardiovascular and adrenal responses, and that's probably the reason behind the impaired uh, exercise responses that you're in an overreach state. Uh, and that just does not create a good environment for adaptation to those periods of training. Yeah. And you, in your paper, you discuss some strategies that can be used or could be used potentially to mitigate some of these negative consequences in, for example, an overload period of training. So can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, well, some of those strategies uh, really go without saying, but, um, and they seem quite obvious, but in practice, sometimes um, they may be not performed as well. So during overload periods of training, it's obviously really important to increase energy intake, uh, and primarily that should be done through increasing carbohydrate intake. Um, but then also uh, looking at protein intake as well. Uh, there's a couple of studies now that have shown um, in periods of overload training, increasing protein intake, even for endurance athletes, can reduce uh, the onset of respiratory tract infections and sickness and things like that. So both carbohydrate and protein uh, intake seem to be effective means of maintaining uh, training quality, but then also preventing some of those other symptoms of overreaching, such as fatigue and sickness. And then uh, also maximizing sleep um, and recovery, which also goes without saying, but what we find in overreached athletes is that they actually have or may have impaired sleep quality. So we don't know if overreaching may impair sleep or whether poor sleep could also lead to overreaching. It's hard to know which way that's going. But in either case, uh, maximising sleep um, and other forms of recovery is probably uh, the way to go in order to cope with the increase in training demands and then also maximise the potential for um, adaptation and positive responses to the increase in training load. Yeah. So conclusions and implications for athletes and coaches from from this review uh, what, what would that be so i think um as we mentioned before the message shouldn't be lost at periods of the training cycle it is really important to train hard and whether that be through increases in training volume or increases in training intensity uh, it's just that the individual responses to training should be monitored so if you have effective um fatigue monitoring and training monitoring systems in place, you can identify an athlete that may not be coping well um, to a given training block and therefore um, you can action that and manipulation in the training load at that given time can be um, can occur. Um, and then also, I guess, profiling athletes. Um, so whether that just be through different performance tests, but you just get a better understanding for the athletes and whether they uh, may be an athlete that could um, or is likely to uh, adapt well to an increase in training load or another athlete that um, you know may not be one that could undertake large amounts of training volume and, and have a high potential to um, adapt quite well to that. So effective training strategies, um, individualising the training content and understanding the athlete that's in front of you. And then also if an athlete is going to undertake um, a period of, of overload training, then are certainly looking at energy intake through protein and carbohydrate and also maximising recovery during those periods is likely going to increase the likelihood of, um, of a positive training response. Yeah. Um, when you say that uh, we certainly need to, to have periods of of high training load of increased training load do you think that it also necessarily means by definition or reaching as per performance decrement or or is it something that well perhaps it could be argued that you could do that to the extent that your performance doesn't decrease or maybe decrease minimally yeah i think so i think um it's likely best to avoid large uh, reductions in performance um, although certainly in some events, Grand Tour cycling, it's likely that athletes are going to be very fatigued following a, a multi-stage tour. So in some sports, um, certainly um, really large increases in training load are unavoidable. Um, but certainly in a lot of examples, it might be ideal to try and avoid those large reductions in performance that come from substantial increases in training load. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, when you're in the Grand Tour, you, you've arrived at the, at the race itself. So, so then you, 
hopefully have built up the maximum amount of fitness that you can have for for that point and then see where it takes you over the three weeks but uh, but during the training period uh yeah that's that's kind of what we can control more easily what than what happens on during the stage race is uh, is a different story but yeah that's that's kind of uh personally what i kind of took away from from the paper or one of the one of the things i took away but one of the things i found really intriguing and made me think was really well maybe just trying to focus on when increasing training load somehow monitoring even if it's through submaximal tests or just subjective performance in in workouts that are repeated that we don't see a decrease in performance or at least not a very big decrease in performance was was one of my personal takeaways from from reading it exactly right yeah i think that's something that yeah, it could certainly be beneficial for a lot of athletes, yeah, avoiding large reductions in performance through um, sudden increases in training load. Yeah. What do you think is uh, is next in this field of, of research? Is, is there a lot of research being done? Do you think that there is scope to do a lot more to repeat these findings that you have seen recently comparing acutely fatigued versus functionally and non-functionally overreached athletes? Yeah, I think so. And, and then in particular, uh, possibly looking at individualised approaches for tapering. Um, we often, um, or there has been a lot of lot more of a focus on individual responses to a given um, overload training period, but individualising the taper um, is probably an area of research um, that I'd certainly be interested in and I think is an area that um, hasn't really see, received too much attention. So... Um, yeah, I think that could be yeah an area for for um, future research, particularly in well trained uh, endurance athletes. Mm, yeah, that would be uh, really interesting. And and what are you working on uh, personally right now? Yeah, I've got lots of projects in the works. Um, we're looking at um, a couple of projects in uh, track endurance and also road cycling. So applying um, some of these concepts, in particular muscle typology, and uh, trying to individualize racing approaches from both a pacing aspect, but then in particular in cycling, um, an individualized uh, cadence approach to try and uh, minimize the reduction in sprint performance towards the end of prolonged cycling. So I think that that study has some pretty good applications, obviously, for, for road cycling events. Um, and then, yeah, we're planning another couple of training studies as well to follow up on some of this work. Um, obviously, a lot of work goes into trying to perform these studies. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've got some pretty cool ideas, so hopefully getting underway with those soon. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm not going to ask you about any of those studies, knowing that they're just ongoing or, or in the works. But uh, but that uh, what you mentioned there about the individualized approach to cadence uh, brings me to ask a general question around cadence and muscle fiber typology, because that's something that... Um, cadence manipulations is used in cycling a lot to uh to do different training interventions we we do a lot of it's, it's very common to do low cadence training to uh to quote unquote increase the fatigue resistance of the type 2 type 2a fibers in particular um that's that's the theory anyway uh what's your take on cadence different cadences and uh, and how that interacts with the muscle fiber typology of an athlete in cycling yeah, so there's probably two ways of looking at that question. Firstly, looking at to maximise sprint cycling performance. Certainly athletes with a higher proportion of fast fibres have a higher optimal cadence, so the cadence that allows them to produce maximal power. When we have a look at more prolonged cycling, so the cadence that um, an athlete might be best to sit at during a prolonged cycling event to try and minimise any of the metabolic responses, for example, we're not quite sure uh, whether submaximal cycling um, cadence may actually relate to muscle fibre type because the couple of studies that have been in, been done in that space are a little bit mixed. And that might be because uh, they've used different um, relative power outputs in terms of um, the power that they were studying um, the cadence at. So we'll hopefully have a few more answers on that aspect, but um, certainly you may think that um, to minimise the physiological cost for a given athlete with a given fibre type, um, we could individualise the cadence profile 
and possibly looking at those um, athletes with more type 1 fibres, um, it may be that they could sit at a lower effective cadence to minimise some of the physiological cost um, and that could work well to uh, prolong um, during prolonged cycling bouts to minimise the uh, reduction in sprint performance. What is the the, me- the potential mechanism for fast, uh, sorry, slow twitch? Did you say slow, slow, slow twitch athletes uh, for them having a lower cadence and minimizing the uh, the metabolic cost? Yeah, so just relating to the, uh, I guess, optimal contraction velocity that allows those fibers to produce power. So that uh, cadence or speed of cycling could be individualized based on the fiber type. Um, and that speed might happen at a lower um, or effective cadence for uh, type 1 fibres compared to subjects with a greater mm. proportion of type 2 fibres. Yeah, it's it's an interesting interaction there with with that aspect of things and then with the thing that I think is what we often hear that, well, with a lower cadence you have a higher torque and then at a higher torque you might recruit a bit more uh, fast fish fibers uh, type 2a uh, at least so so i guess that's where yeah it it becomes really interesting to see like how do you optimize that how how low can you go without getting the torque too high so that you really have to dig into those uh, those type 2a fibers yeah and then obviously with a much lower cadence and the torque being so high then that um, brings in um, other uh, neuromuscular fatigue, for example, just with the um, high torque that needs to be produced. So, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty interesting area. So we'll hopefully have a few more answers to that soon. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's something that will be very interesting to see. Uh, let's uh, wrap up here with uh, some rapid-fire questions. So take just one sentence to answer each of these. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? Uh, well, I love listening to podcasts. So uh, apart from yours, another one that I really enjoyed listening to recently is called From Paper to Podium, um, and that's run by Charlie Webster and also James Morton, and they bring in applied research but also world-class athletes that uh, engage in that research as well. So it's a really interesting listen. And what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Um, well, pretty young in my career so far, so I haven't achieved too much success, but uh yeah, I guess being in a university system and um, to do applied sports science research, you've got to have really good relationships with athletes and coaches. So uh, yeah, I guess just building those relationships um, and trying to improve performance and working together with them um, has probably been one aspect where we've hopefully been able to move towards a little bit of success with our research. Yeah, I think I should uh, I should figure out a way to to rephrase this question because you're the second one who has commented on it. The, the way I... I kind of think about the question is more so related to success being just getting getting the best out of yourself uh, in day day by day, you know, whether it's in training or in work or in, uh, family life relations and so on. That's that's uh, that's the way it's it's uh, viewed from my perspective. But but yeah, it's maybe a bit um, yeah. I don't know. The phrasing might might not be the best one. No, uh, I think it's anyway. a great question for sure. Yeah. Anyway, uh, finally, who's somebody you look up to and admire? Um, I guess professionally thinking, um, really look up to a, a mentor of mine, Professor Alan Hahn. He was one of the founding applied sports scientists at the Australian Institute of Sport many years ago, and he's now got a role at the Queensland Academy of Sport. Uh, and he's a mentor of mine and, and really look up to him and what he's done for, for sports science here in Australia. Yeah, that's great. And uh, finally, uh, for listeners that want to follow you and your work, uh, what are the best places to to do so? Um, I guess Twitter is pretty popular these days. So just at Phil underscore Bellinger, um, or you can find my email on um, any of the latest research papers that we've, we've published. Yeah, yeah. And on ResearchGate, I, I want to plug that as well. You have at least some of your articles, they are uh, open access. So uh, So that's another good place. Yeah, I normally keep that up to date as well. So, yeah, definitely happy to share any papers on there. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Phil. It's uh, been great to have you on. And uh, yeah, look forward to potentially catching up again to when you have some new research that we can discuss. Yeah, thanks so much. Really enjoyed the chat.
I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com where we'll have links to Phil's profiles on ResearchGate and Twitter, as well as several of the studies that we mentioned in this episode and talked about. If you are considering upping your triathlon game and are interested in improving your performance, then consider checking out the coaching services and training plans that we offer on scientifictriathlon.com. We've helped hundreds or thousands of athletes if we include all the ready-made training plans and uh, hope that you can be one of the next athletes that we help uh, improve your endurance performance. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Check out the resources like the free online sweat test, the quick carb calculator, and also make sure to book a free video consultation with one of the experts on Precision Hydration to discuss your hydration and fueling strategy. You can get 15% off your first order with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Senate that you can find on senateswimtrainer.com. The swim trainer is the perfect tool both for those athletes that want to up their swim stimulus frequency but don't have time to go to the pool more often or to the open water more often than they're already doing. You can get more than 40% off your order of the swim trainer until mid-August when the summer sale ends. Just go to senateswimtrainer.com for slash TTS and use the discount code that you'll get on that page. I'll be back next Monday with another interview where we'll discuss the research of functional threshold power testing FTP and whether 95% is an accurate correction factor. Until then, thank you as always for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft laws.